All right, let's go and get started. Um, so, first off, uh, let me get the sign-in sheet. Pass around. Um, so, hopefully, the uh, the online lecture uh, from last week worked out well for everybody. Um, the homework uh, or your first MATLAB assignment is due today, so uh, you need to be turning that into your uh, your network drive. Remember, there should be two parts to it. There should be a, a Word document with screen clippings, um, as well as a little blurb of text at the very end describing how the second part of the homework ran, which is your, your script, your MATLAB program. So um, since we, uh, we actually didn't meet on Thursday, and it was just an online lecture, I thought I should ask, does anybody have any, oh, sorry, does anybody have any general questions about the homework or about script writing or anything, anything I can do to address? Yes, sir. Well, you should be able to save the program to the network drive. Yeah, I want the program. Yeah, the actual .m file. So, yeah, so if you haven't already uploaded your m file to the network drive, go ahead and do so now. Okay. Any other questions? Okay. So like I said, your m file and your word document should be in the network drive. Um, I thought I would take a moment and mention uh, how we did at the Virginia's conference. Um, we did pretty well. Um, we placed second in the transportation competition. We placed first in the uh, concrete bowling. Um, I'm sure some of you are, are aware of the, the two major competitions, though, which are the bridge and the canoe. Um, we actually did, uh, elected not to do a canoe this year, but um, I think by making that decision, the folks that went uh, saw the canoe races, and I think they've got the itch to, to do one next year. So. Um, uh, uh, I guess that's sort of a plug for those of you who might be interested in it. For the bridge, the bridge team did very well. Um, they got fourth out of 13, uh, so they did, they did pretty well. And I guess my challenge is for you all who are interested in getting involved with the bridge um, next year, I guess I would say um, they got fourth. You all, I dare you to get better, to do third, to do second, to do first. So, um, and Marshall has won the, the bridge competition before, so um, I know it's definitely within your, uh, uh, your ability to do so. Okay, um, anything else? Oh, um, a couple other things. Uh, there is a job fair today in the student center, am I right, from like one to four? Yeah, so uh, you, if you're interested, you might want to go check that out. And uh, what's that? Oh, okay. Um, let's see what else. Oh, there's an ASC, an SAME ASC meeting tonight. I believe it starts at 6 p.m. and it's in, um, I think it's 2241. Um, there'll be food, but they'll be talking about the, uh, the, the conference, how it went, um, and we're uh, probably going to start uh, officer elections for next year, uh, or at least start taking names and we might have actual voting happen uh, at the following meeting. Okay, sound good? All right. Um, with uh, uh, nothing else, let's go ahead and get jump back into MATLAB. Um, today I want to talk about uh, arrays, um, or another word for array is matrices. I actually want to start talking about matrices, but I'm going to keep it very, very simple, and I'm going to talk about 1D arrays or one-dimensional arrays, um, and specifically make sure everybody understands how the colon operator and the brackets work. I think you all found when you were working on uh, this last homework that if you use brackets, MATLAB gets a little confused just because MATLAB interprets brackets uh, a little differently. And then we're going to be going into some things like polynomials, basic plotting, uh, and things like that. So I'm going to open MATLAB. Actually, uh, today we're going to spend most of our time, or actually all of our time, in the command window. We're actually not going to be writing a script because I just want to do some demonstrations on how array calculations work. We're actually not going to be doing things like simultaneous equations or, um, or uh, 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 you know, solving a system or anything like that. It's just more about array construction, how arrays work, uh, etc. Okay, so I'll admit I'll be hopping back and forth between PowerPoint and, uh, and MATLAB, so um, forgive me for that, but I, but I think it's going to be, um, be kind of important. So, <coughs> first off, you all have these notes uh, available on Blackboard, or you should, so um, you can follow along with me. Um, so the reason why this is important is because in order to really, really get what all MATLAB can do, um, you really need to 
understand how arrays work and how, how matrices work. Um, I'm not saying that we need to do full-blown complex matrix math, but we do need to understand how MATLAB interprets you know, tables of values. Now, for right now, we're just going to stick to one-dimensional arrays. If you all remember from uh, uh, matrix algebra, I'm sure you all, I mean, we've done it in here, but a matrix is a table of numbers. You know, it might be uh, a four by three matrix, you know, four rows and three columns. For now, we're just sticking to what I'm calling one-dimensional arrays, like a single row of numbers or a single column uh, of numbers. Um, the reason why is because one-dimensional arrays are really widely used in programming applications, um, in plotting. Um, uh, they're used for things like finding roots of equations, multiplying polynomials, and, and they have really a, a wide array of uses. Uh, in my opinion, I think that one-dimensional arrays, in a lot of cases, are more useful than full-blown two-dimensional matrices, so I think it's a, a little easier. Now, what do I mean by an array? What do I mean by a one-dimensional array? Okay. Well, first off, for now, we're just going to operate in the command window, so we're not going to really be writing a script. Okay. Um, up until now, we've been writing some basic programs, and what we've been doing is dealing with variables, and we've been assigning values to variables. So by now, I think you all fully understand, if I were to type something in the command window, so I've got MATLAB here, if I were to type something in the command window, like let's say x equals 5, like that, <laughs> you know, that's a, a very simple command line, but there's a lot going on, if you think about it. Okay, for number one, um, I have x equals 5, so it evaluates this 5, and then it assigns that value to x. Remember, the semicolon suppresses the echo, so it doesn't echo the result out. Okay? Now, if you look, what I have here is I have the variable x, and I have assigned to it just a single value of 5. Okay? Now, that, that's great if all you're doing is working with a single value. But what if I want to store a bunch of values within x? That's where arrays come into play. So what I have here on this slide is <coughs> instead of storing 5, let's say I've got a whole series of numbers. You know, 5, 6, 8, 0, 4, etc. Okay? Well, what I can do is I can store an array of values by using brackets. Okay? So instead of doing that, let's do this. Let's do x equals, and then we'll say, well, we got 5, comma, 6, comma, 8, comma, 0, comma, what is it, 4, comma, 3.2. And I, I just threw the 3.2 in just to be different, okay? So now if I press enter, again, it's going to suppress the output because I've got that semicolon there. But if you notice, instead of just a single value being stored in X, I've got a bunch of values being stored in X, okay? Does that make sense? Okay. Now, to give you kind of an idea of what this would look like, um, let me double click. You know, you can go over here on Workspace. You can double click this. And if you do that, you should have a little uh, variable box pop up. And if you notice, see how this variable box looks a lot like Excel? You all see that? Okay. What this is basically saying is that I am storing a table of values inside X. In this case, I'm just I'm storing what I'm calling a one-dimensional table. It's just a single row. Like a two-dimensional would be like rows and columns, which we will do. We'll deal with that, uh, deal with that later. Okay? Is everybody with me so far? Okay. All right. So let's sort of track on. Okay. Now, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to go ahead and close this variable space. Okay. Now, a couple things to, to keep in mind. Um, right now you can see that I have filled the variable with numbers. Okay? Well, I can fill it with more than numbers. Okay? So like for instance, um, here you know, I filled it with numbers and you can see we uh, investigated all of the uh, uh, results. But what I can also do is I can fill it with computations. So for instance, instead of just uh, filling it with numbers, I can go in and I can say, you know what, how about this? Let's say I'm dealing with uh, a y 
uh, array. And instead of numbers, I've got something like the log of 2.6, um, or the square root of 3, or, you know, 5 raised to the 1.2. I can do that too. There's nothing wrong with that as well. Okay? And press enter. Okay? And if you notice, you can see now I've got a new uh, uh, variable. We're calling that y, and it's a table of values. Okay? Is everybody with me on that? Okay. Another thing that you can do with, um, with arrays is you can store other variables inside an array. So, for instance, let's say I've got a Z, um, uh, a Z array, and I might say something like, okay, let's start off by the first value being pi, okay? Then I could say, how about the next value being 9, or the next value being, you know, uh, what have you, let's say, you know, 7 or something, or 6, or it doesn't really matter. Okay, I can do that. So, remember, if you remember, pi is a previously defined variable, so I, I can do that. Um, another thing I can do, and th this is kind of nifty, is I can go back to this z dimension, or this z uh, variable, and instead of a 9, I can actually take, all right, look at what y is. See how y is like three terms? Does everybody see that? I can take this 9, and I can replace it with a y. Okay, now let me show you something. So look what it's going to do. It's going to say pi, then whatever y is, and then 6. So y is going to be this. So how long do you think, if I press enter, how long do you think z is going to be at the very end for this example? Like how many terms right now are in y? Three. Okay, so I've got one, and then I'll have those three terms here, and then another one, so it'll be five, right? Does everybody, does that make sense? So what... what it, if it's a little iffy, just bear with me. Okay, so I, I executed that line, and then I want to I show you some things. So let's go ahead and double-click Y and see what it looks like. So if you double-click Y, you should see values of like 0.9555. You should see about a 1.73 and a 6.899. Like Does everybody see that? Well, look what I did for Z. I said Z was pi, whatever this junk is, and then 6, right? All right, well, if I open up Z, what do I have? Pi, whatever this junk is, and then 6, right? Technical terms, right? <laughs> Does that make sense? Okay, I really want you to have the ability to start creating arrays, stacking them together, making, you know, uh, uh, piecing them together, making sure that makes sense. That's something I want you to be variable, very comfortable with is the ability to create an array from different values, different computations, different arrays, okay? Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? All right. Okay, let me close all this. Okay. Now, this is really important, okay? So let me, let me clear out all this command one. Let me clear this out. Well, first off, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to clear all my variables out and then clear the command window. Y'all remember that? If you type in clear, that'll clear all these variables in the workspace. And if you type in CLC, that'll clear your command window. Y'all remember that? Okay. Now, here's what I'm going to do. I want to create a, another type of array. So we'll call it X. Okay. Now, here's the thing with this array. I want this array to consist of sequential numbers. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Now, there's a couple ways of going about that. Um, one of the ways I can do that is I can do that. I can literally just type it out. Okay? And that's fine. Alright? It'll work. And honestly, I'll say if I was dealing with a really, really short uh, array that was only going to have a couple terms, that's what I'd probably do. Um, so if, if you've got two or three values and you need to type that in, that's fine. Okay. Now this array has what, 10 values? Is that about right? Okay, well what if you have a, a, an array that needs thousands of values? 
What if you need an array that contains the numbers one to a thousand? Which is not that unheard of in things like plotting, things like programming. I mean, that, that's not that uncommon to need an array with a lot of numbers. Am I going to sit there and just type in those numbers over and over again? That's a bit much, right? So what I'm going to do is this. Instead, I'm going to show you all how the colon operator works. So this isn't a semicolon. This is just a, a, a colon. So you press shift semicolon to, to get this to pop up. But instead, I'm going to do this. I'm going to go x equals, and I'm going to go 1 to 10. And that's sort of what that means, 1 to 10. Okay? All right? And then press enter, and that'll do the same thing. Okay? The advantage is, what if I needed to do 1 to 10,000? You know what I mean? I can just press enter, and it'll just create it for me. Instead of having to type in every single number, okay? Again, these are pretty common when you want to do things like graphing, when you want to do things like um, uh, things like a, a, a programming uh, task where you want it to do the same thing over and over again. It's very common to need to have a, a vector of this size. Sound good? Okay. Um, to give you kind of an example, uh, of where this would come into play in terms of graphing. Do you all remember when we did the Casio and uh, we were doing a table of values? Y'all remember that? So we would pick a starting value, an ending value, and then an increment. Y'all remember that? And so a lot of times on our graphing problems, we would have something like this. We'd have something like x equals, and we would say, I want you to graph that equation from x equals, let's say, negative 5 to x equals 5. And what it would do is it would say, all right, let's close this up and press enter. And if you open up x, that's what it would look like. You know, negative 5, negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Y'all remember doing that on the Casio? Okay. Now that's great, but how much is it changing from value to value? What's the increment? What's the step? One, okay? Let's say I want the step to be different. Let's say I want the step to be one half, okay? Well, in order to do that, what I would do is this, is I would say, all right, I want you to go x equals, I want you to start at negative five. I want you to step in increments of, what do we say, uh, 0.5, like a half, so 0 0.5, until you get to five. Okay? You all see that? If you do not put a central value inside that uh, array, it will automatically assume that your step is 1. Okay? Make sense? So if I press enter, now look at your array. Double click and open it. Look at what it does. Negative 5, negative 4.54, negative 3.53, negative 2.52. See what it's doing? that make sense? Okay. So here's a couple examples uh, of how that works. Okay. So let, let's just sort of review these. Okay. So let's start off with the first one. One to seven. If I don't put a central number, it assumes that that step is one. So what's it going to report? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Sound good? Now let's say my central number is a 2. Well, it's going to start at 1 and then it's going to jump in increments of 2, right? So it's going to say 1 and then 3 and then 5 and then 7, 9, 11, da 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 da. And it's going to keep doing that until that last number, which is 7. So if I do 1, 2, 7, I'll tell you what, we can sort of play around with this. I'll just type in. 1, 2, 7. Here, let me close this. I'll just type in 1. Here, let's do this. CLC. Let's just type in 1, 2, 7 and press enter. Now, if I do this, I haven't assigned a variable. So if I press enter, where, uh, where is this value going to go? What's it going to be assigned to? Answer, A and S, right? So, and because I'm not putting a semicolon, it's just going to evaluate it. So press that, and what do we have? 1, 3, 5, 7. Does that make sense? 
Everybody okay with that? Now, what if you have something that's a, a little odd, no pun intended? What if you have this? What if you have two, then you go in increments of two to let's say 11, okay? Now this, this doesn't really make a lot of sense because if I start at two and I go in increments of two, it should be like two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, da, 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 right? 11 doesn't pop up in that sequence at all. Well, the way that MATLAB interprets it is it says, all right, we'll start at two, we'll say, okay, and then we'll go in increments of two. So the next value is four, the next value is six, next value is eight, next value is 10. The next value would be 12, but that's larger than this. So it cuts it off. Does that make sense? Another point to mention, notice how all of these increments are increasing, right? We're starting at 2 and getting larger, okay? What if I want it to go backwards? What if I want to start at 16 and then count downwards? I would use an increment of negative 4. Does everybody see that? So 16, then going down in increments of 4 until you get to 0. Does that make sense? All right. Does anybody have any questions about that? This is pretty important. I want to make sure this is clear. Because things like, um, things like uh, 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 programming stuff we're going to see later, plotting options, you really need to make sure that this is, uh, this is clear. Okay. Sound good? All right. Now, um, one thing that I, I've been a little fast and loose with, but, but I do want to emphasize right now, is if you're dealing with a one-dimensional array, those two boxes there on the top right will give you the same answer. Uh, in other words, you don't need to use brackets. Okay? I highly recommend that you do, especially when you're a beginner with MATLAB. The, the reason why is because if you're using brackets, I think that is a visual indication that what you are dealing with is a table. Okay? Um, if you don't use brackets, I think more often than not you're going to interpret that as just a single variable. Brackets to me are sort of MATLAB's way of telling me, okay, I'm dealing with an array. So um, other than maybe like for loops that we're going to see a little later, um, I'm going to sort of... I guess to make it policy that if you're dealing with arrays, you ought to be using brackets, at least for now. I mean, later on, you'll, uh, you'll probably see, okay, I don't really need them. Okay. Sound good? Everybody okay with this? Right. Okay. Now, a couple other ways that you can um, create equally spaced values is to use a function called linspace. It stands for linearly spaced values. So let's say I want, um, let, let, let me try and give you kind of an idea of where this would work. Okay. So let's clear this out. All right. So let's say I want a vector from 1 to 10. Well, well that's easy, right? A vector from 1 to 10. If I, do, uh, if I don't put a central value, it'll just do increments of 1, right? Now, how many terms are in that, um, in that vector or in that row? 10, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. If I do something like 1 to 10, and I, my increment is 1 half, well, that'll give me... 19 values, right? Does that make sense? Because you start off at one and then you're stepping, you know, half each way. What if I want a specific number of terms that are spaced evenly from one to ten? Something odd like, like 37 or 35. Well, I could do the math to come up with an increment, but I think an easier way to go about this, let me clear this out, CLC. Um, I think an easier way to go about this is to use linspace. So I'll do linspace, and I want to go from 1 to 10, and I want to uh, have a total of 35 terms. I press enter, 
and it does the math to ensure that I have 35 equally spaced terms from 1 to 10. This is a really, really powerful option if you're trying to graph something, okay? And you want equally spaced points from, you know, the beginning of the graph to the end of the graph. That'll work out very well. Um, everybody with me so far? I would say that lens space works the best when you have numbers that aren't, aren't very pretty, okay? Does that make sense? I mean, like 1 to 10 in increments of 1, that's easy. 1 to 10 in increments of 35, bless you, is, uh, I mean, you've got some really, you know, funky decimals, 8.4118, 8.7675, uh, et cetera. Sound good? Okay, now, um, let me clear this out. So I'll hit clear, CLC. Okay, now, um, let's, let's create a variable. Let's call it x, all right? And let's linearly space some values from 0 to, let's say, 2 pi. And let's say I want 10 values, okay? So x equals... Uh, Lens space from 0 to 2 pi, and I want 10 values, okay? So press enter, and there's your, your vector there on the right. Remember, we, press, we included a semicolon, so we suppressed the output. Now, <coughs> this would be a very perfect example of a vector that we would use for graphing. Specifically, if we were trying to graph something like a trig function, like a sine or a cosine. Okay, just think, you all know that the sine function and the cosine function, it repeats from 0 to 2 pi, it just repeats over and over and over again, it's just one big wave. So I've got 10 points between 0 and 2 pi. Um, if I wanted a more accurate graph, I might use something like 100 points or 1,000 points, right? The more points, the better I'm going to approximate that, that sine curve, right, or that cosine curve. Make sense? Okay. Now. Um, I want to ex uh, explain something. So this is x equals 0 to 2 pi in increments of 10, uh, or, in, or with 10 total uh, terms. All right. If I double-click the variable and open it, I mean, let's look at the values. I've got 0, 0.6981, 1.3963, etc., until I get to here, which is 2 pi, right? Now, what is the sixth value in this, um, in this vector? What is it? Is that 3.491? Does everybody see that? Everybody see this term right here? 3.49? Okay. Let me close this. <laughs> so if you notice in my, in my program, I've got x defined. If I want to reference a particular term inside that vector, I would say vector x, but I want the sixth term. You notice I'm using the term vector and array interchangeably. Vector is uh, another term or another word for a matrix that only has one row or one column. So I'll, I'll probably use that term interchangeably. But if I say I want the sixth term of X and I press enter, it gives me the 3.497. If you recall when you did that last homework assignment, remember how some of you all would forget to put the multiplication sign in? And you go, well, how come it's not multiplying? So, oh, you've got to put the multiplication sign in. Well, here's why. Because MATLAB treats this notation as if it's a reference. Like, here's array x, and tell me what is the sixth term of x. Okay? If I want to um, multiply, I have to say something like, here's uh, x, and then I have to multiply, whoop, multiply it times 6. Okay? I've got to include that multiplication symbol to tell MATLAB that I want to do multiplication. Otherwise, it's going to think of this as an, uh, uh, as an array reference. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Okay. Now, um, if you know how to reference um, arrays, then you can modify them pretty easily. Okay? So, here's our vector, right? So, it's from 0 to 2 pi and it's an increment, it has 10 total steps. So let me pull up the slideshow. So our vector 
looks something like this, 0, 0.6981, da, 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 et cetera, right? Okay, now let's say I want to take that vector and I want to change it a little bit. For instance, I want to take the seventh value in that vector and I want to make it a zero. That's sort of where the, the parentheses will come into play. So uh, going into my command window, I've got my vector defined. So if I say, all right, what's my seventh value? Right now, my seventh value is 4.1888, okay? What if I say, you know what, I want to change that a little bit. I want that seventh value to equal zero. Just the seventh value, not the whole thing, just the seventh value. If I do that and press enter, or let me, I can suppress it or not, it doesn't really matter. Now open up X. And see what it looks like. See what happened to the seventh value? That turned into zero, right? Does that make sense? It's not bad, right? Pretty straightforward stuff. Okay? We can get a little fancier with it uh, if we would like. Okay? Let's say, for instance, I want terms 2 to 4, all of these terms, I want them all to be, let's say, 3. So I can say, go down to my command window, and I can say x from... 2 to 4, those terms all have to be 3, okay? Does that make sense what I'm doing right here? I want to take this value, this value, and this value and turn them into a 3. Now, if I press enter, bam. Does that make sense? It's not bad, right? Okay? Another thing I can do is I can say, you know what? Let's take um, values 2 to 5. 2 to 5, oh. so I've got 2, 3, 4, 5, and I want to change those into something like 2, 4, 6, 8. So maybe what I would do is I would say 2 space 2 up until 8. Does that make sense? So I'm taking this vector right here, 2, 4, 6, 8, and I'm assigning it to, want to this term, this term, this term, and this term. Press enter, and bam. Now, the only thing I'll mention is you really got to be careful when you do that. You've got to make sure that the size of your expression is the same as the size of your, your assignment. In other words, you can't have, you know, 20 terms over here and trying to assign it to, to two terms over here. It's got to be the same size, okay? Does that make sense? Like this has one, two, three, four terms in it. Two to five is one, two, three, four terms in it. Everybody okay with that? That's not bad, right? Okay. Now, let's talk, uh, let's talk turkey. Let's talk some, some applications of some of this stuff. And I want to keep it pretty straightforward and see that you all are finding some, some, uh, some benefit out of this. I want you to see some use to all this. Okay. Now, one of, these, uh, one of the uses for a lot of this uh, array uh, referencing is polynomials. Now, you all are engineers, so um, you should be well uh, uh, oriented to polynomials, right? You know, quadratic equations, cubic equations. You all have, have um, been exposed to those quite a lot by now. Now, MATLAB has a very wide selection of, uh, of functions that you can use to manipulate polynomials. And, and I've chosen to show you these because I, I genuinely think you all are going to see some, uh, some benefit uh, to these polynomials, uh, these polynomial functions. So polynomials in MATLAB are represented as vectors. Okay? So for instance, if I'm trying to represent the polynomial 8x plus 5, MATLAB would represent that as 8 comma 5, okay? If I was trying to do 2x squared minus 4x plus 10, MATLAB would, would interpret that with the, uh, the, the vector 2 comma negative 4 comma 10, okay? So basically all I have to do is just report all of these coefficients, okay? In order, okay? So if this was, 
you know, something like minus 4x plus 2x squared plus 10. I have to get it in descending order and then uh, define it, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, another thing, if there's a zero term in there, you've got to put the zero in. For instance, 6x squared minus 150. Well, the quadratic term is six, or the quadratic coefficient is 6. The linear coefficient, there is no x, so it's really x times 0. So I've got to put the 0 in, 0, and then minus uh, 150. Okay, so to give you, this is a, a funky one, 5x to the fifth plus 6x squared minus 7x. Well, there's an x to the fifth term, no x to the fourth, no x to the third, an x squared, a linear term, and no constant term. Okay, so you've got to type all of those values uh, in. Does that make sense? Okay, so make sure you put your zeros in, make sure it's in descending order, okay? So I'm going to show you all some nifty polynomial functions, and I'm going to show you them uh, using this. Now this is funky, okay? So it's x to the fifth um, minus 12.1x to the fourth plus 40.59x to the third, and so on, right? So first thing I want to do in MATLAB right now is just to make sure I'm not confusing myself is I want to go in here and I want to clear out all my variables. So I type in clear and then CLC. So let me close this. So what that should have done is cleared out your workspace and cleared out your command window. Okay. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to define that equation that you see there on that slide that uh, x to the, what was it, x to the fifth and 12.1x to the fourth. I'm going to define all those constants and I'm going to call them c. So we'll say c equals and then start typing it in. So the x to the fifth coefficient is 1, comma, 12.1x to the fourth, that's negative, so minus 12.1, right? 40.59, comma, negative 17.015, comma, negative 71.95, comma, 35.88. Okay. Does everybody see what I did there? All right, so if I press enter, if you look over here on the right, you should see that variable that, uh, or that array pop up. Did I get all my constants right? Did I mix one up? Those are all good? Okay. Now, now you all are, are experts at math, right? You know everything there is to know. Everything there is to know. You all are experts at it. One of the first things that you learn about functions is how to evaluate a function, right? I have f of x. How would I determine f of 0? Let's keep f of 0 simple. What is f of 0 for that function? 35.88. How did you figure that out? So you plug in x, uh, 0 for x, right? So what I'm proposing is that this term polyval, P-O-L-Y-V-A-L, that function will do exactly that. It will plug in 0 and tell you what the answer is. Let's see if that's right. So polyval, so here's how this works. We have polyval. What polynomial are we evaluating? We're, we're evaluating this polynomial, C, and we're plugging in a value of 0. 35.88. Now, what if you were trying to do something a little more intricate, like 9? Bam. Simple. Now, how did, I, how did I retype polyval so quickly? Did I retype it? Use the up and down arrows, right? Remember, get, get used to doing that. Okay? This is simple stuff, right? This isn't too bad. That right there will save you uh, a lot of time um, evaluating, you know, something like polynomials. Just type in your coefficients and just plug and chug. Okay? Now, that one's simple. Okay? Let's do a little bit, uh, some more interesting ones. Um, if I have, let me ask this, if I have a quadratic equation, quadratic, how many roots are there to that equation? 
Remember a root is when the, uh, the value that makes the equation equal to zero? Two, right? So how many roots should this equation have? It's an equation, the highest term is to the fifth order. How many roots? Five, right? How do I determine what the roots are to this equation? Roots. So equal, or so just do roots of C, bam. So I really want you all to understand the, 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 the rapid uh, ability of this. How many of you all have, uh, how, how many times have you all solved a, a quadratic equation? A lot, right? I mean, if I gave you a quadratic equation like x squared was like minus 5x plus or minus 6 or something, right? So if I did something like, you know, uh, f equals x squared, let's say minus 5x minus 6 equals 0, and I said, what are the roots of f? Bam. Oh, I forgot a comma there. I wonder it only gave me one root. Bam. Bam. There's your roots. That's simple, right? None of that negative b plus or minus b squared minus 4ac over 2a. Just, there you go. Or square root of b squared minus 4ac. Simple stuff, right? This isn't bad. Now, I want to go back here. Let me, let me clear something out. Let me clear this out. Now, roots. Okay, roots of C. So did everybody get this or something like this? Did anybody not get roots of C? Did anybody not get 6.54, 2.3, et cetera? Did anybody not get this? Okay, all right. I'm, so, I'm not that good. I can't look at this equation and see what it looks like. I mean, what's the most useful tool in mathematics for having an equation wanting to see what it looks like? We take that equation and we graph it, right? So, or we plot it. So, what is the largest root here? Is it 6.5? What's the smallest? The negative 1.2. So, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to... Um, I want to create a graph of this equation, okay? Now, the way I want to do this is I want to create a graph of this equation that goes, you know, on the outside of these roots. In other words, if I create some x values, let's say from minus 1.5 all the way to 7, like that would get smaller than our smallest root and larger than that one. Is that, is that a fair point? Now, one of the things I am missing is a central value. Or in other words, a step. Like I want to go from minus 1.5 to 7, and I want to go in so many increments. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go from minus 1.5 to 7, and I'm going to do it in increments of 0 0.1. So it's going to start off at minus 1.5, it's going to go minus 1.5, minus 1.4, minus 1.3, minus 1.2, minus 1.1. It's going to keep going and going and going until it gets to 6.7, 6.8, 6.9, 6.7. Okay? So in other words, the smaller this value is, the more points. Does that make sense? Okay. So we'll press enter. Okay, so if you want to think, you can think this is my x-axis, if you will. I, don't get, I want to graph this. And I want to go from x equals minus 1.5 to x equals 7. Sound good? Now my y-axis, well, I've got to evaluate this function. So here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to say polyval. So I'm going to say y equals polyval. I want to evaluate this function. And remember what polyval does. I take a value of x and I plug and chug, right? So instead of plugging in x equals 0 or x equals, you know, uh, uh, x equals 0, x equals 9, I'm going to plug in all these values, all these x values. So it's taking this entire array and plugging and chugging. So if I press enter, 
look what I've got. I've got 86 X terms, 86 Y terms. Each one of those values, it plugged into that equation. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? Why is that important? Watch this. So here's my x-axis. My y-axis was just plugging and chugging into that equation. Let's plot x and y. You press enter. Now it might take a little while and you should get something like that. Everybody see that? Now, what are roots? Remember, roots are where the function equals zero, right? So see what we've got? We've got this is our y-axis and that's zero. See that? Okay, in other words, if I plotted that and drew that horizontal line, would you agree it looks something about like that? So what is my, what are my roots? Well, what is this? This is about... So about negative 1.2 was that about one half? And we got here about 2.3. We got here about four. 6.5. You all see that? So to give you give you a little bit of a simpler example, so that you all have a little bit of a clear instance of what you're doing. Here's a pop quiz to make sure you all understand this. To define a polynomial, how would I do y equals x squared? Like, how would I do that? Remember, like 8x minus 5 would be 8 comma minus 5. How would I do y equals x squared? No, no. 1, 0, 0. Does that make sense? Everybody okay with that? So what I'm going to do is let me clear all this stuff out. I like clearing out every now and then. So I'm going to create a polynomial C equals and we're going to go 1, 0, 0 because that's y equals x squared, right? Because it's x squared plus 0x plus 0. Right? So y equals x squared and then I'm going to plot that parabola. So we'll say let's go x equals let's go from let's say minus 10 to 10. I'm just keeping it simple. So y equals polyval c comma x. So I'm taking these values of x and plugging them into this polynomial, right? Okay and then plotting. Looks familiar, right? Not bad, right? Pretty straightforward. Any questions? Any questions about any of this? Later on, we'll, we'll we will have some very, we'll probably have a lecture just on plotting, just how to plot and how to do that appropriately. How to put legends on it and change your axes up and all that. For now, I want to I wanna move on, okay? But uh, does, is everybody okay with this so far? Now, here's a real useful um, application of polynomials. You all remember foiling, right? Remember that, how to foil? Like if I had this, I would do, First times first, outside times outside, inside times inside, last times last. Y'all remember that? Okay. Well, in, uh, in MATLAB, MATLAB will perform a convolution by, uh, or it's called a convolution, that, that type of multiplication in the world of mathematics, that foiling is also called a convolution. It will actually foil this stuff out for you. What I can do is this. I can define this polynomial, which think this would be 1, 0, 1, right? This one would be 2 and 7, and I can multiply them out. So watch this. So let's 
So we have A equals 101. So x squared plus 0x plus 1. B equals, what was it, 2 and 7? And then if I convolute A and B, I get this. So what would my answer be? It would be 2x cubed plus 7x squared plus 2x plus 7. Imagine how long that would take to do by hand. Now that one's simple, but what if you had a really, really long one? I think you all know by now it just takes forever, right? You can check your work. Okay. Any questions? Okay. All right, let me clear some stuff out. Clear and CLC. Okay, now. Okay. Now, naturally, we'd like to be able to make predictions with a given set of data. And we did this in Excel quite a bit, right? Like I gave you all some data points and I said, all right, let's do some interpolation, let's make some predictions, etc. Okay, well, MATLAB can do the same thing. And I'd argue that if you have a really, really, really big data set, I'd argue that MATLAB does it better. Okay, now I want to demonstrate that, um, that capability by looking at the following X and Y uh, data points. So if you notice, here I've got a bunch of values of X and here I've got a bunch of values of Y. And all these are just points. Like I take each one of these and I say 0.9 comma 0.9, that puts me right here. 1.5 and 1.5 puts me right here. 3 and 2.5 go 3, 2.5 I'm right here. 4 and 5.1, 4, 5.1. You, you see what these are? They're just, they're just points, okay? So I'm going to type all of those in and define uh, X and Y. So because I'm lazy, I'm just going to copy and paste. Of course, you all need to type them in. All right. All right. Y'all see what I did? Just went and defined X and defined Y. Okay. Alright. So while you all are working on that, I've got X terms and I've got Y terms. Um, one of the first things that I showed you all how to do early on in the semester was linear interpolation. Y'all remember that? Yeah. Okay. So how did linear interpolation work? Well, I've got a point here at what? X equals 1.5 and I got a point here at X equals like 2.5, right? So what if I wanted a value in the middle? Well, it would draw a straight line. It would figure out where that is, and then interpolate. Y'all remember that? Well, MATLAB will do the same thing with the interpolate function. Now, I actually, I typed this out because I think it looks a little weird. The function is interpolate. It's I-N-T-E-R-P, and that's not an L. That's a 1, okay? So it's I-N-T-E-R-P 1, okay? So if I interpolate, you know, so first off, let's look at this picture, right? So if I plug in x equals 2, that's going to put me somewhere on this line, right? So if I drag that up, it's about right there, drag that over, it's somewhere about 2, right? Maybe a little, little less than 2. So if I go into MATLAB, I say interp 1, it's not an L, between x and y, and I want to plug in a value of 2, that's what it's given me. That's not bad, right? Let's say you want to um, do some regression, right? Remember how in uh, Excel we would try and fit a trend line? Y'all remember trend lines? Where I've got uh, a bunch of data points and I'm trying to figure out, uh, if I'm trying to fit, let's say, a line where should I put that line to kind of best fit the data, right? Or maybe it should be a, um, uh, 
Maybe it should be a, a polynomial, like a quadratic or a cubic equation or something like that. Um, easiest way to go about that is to just use polyfit. So, for instance, um, let me show you something. So if I've got polyfit, so let's do polyfit. And we're going to fit an equation between x and y, and uh, I need to pick the order of that equation. So if I do an order of 1, that's going to be a linear equation. So plug and chug, and here's what I get. So that might not make a lot of sense, but what I'm saying is that based on that data that I plugged in, the best fit line would be y equals mx plus b or y equals 0.5688x plus that, the 0.998. Okay? So that's my slope, that's my y-intercept. If I was trying to do something like a cubic equation, you know, the, the higher your order, the best, the better your answers get. So maybe if I'm trying to do a cubic equation, I'll get this. <coughs> so the equation that best predicts that data, if it's a cubic equation, would be uh, y equals 0.022x cubed minus 0.4x squared plus 2.61x minus 1.42, something like that. Sound good? This isn't that bad, is it? Now, how many calculus folks do we have in here? All right, all right. I can tell you all are probably at your limit with that stuff. That, you, that one was easy. That one was just easy. All right, watch this, okay? Let's, tr let's try and define a, uh, a polynomial, and let's say it's 3x squared minus 2x plus 4, or plus 4. Would you agree that's how you define that polynomial? Not too bad, right? How do you take the derivative? Well, let's just do it analytically. All right. If here's my function and I'm trying to take the derivative, if you haven't had calculus yet, don't worry about it. But uh, if you have, um, what do we got here? Well, 3 times the derivative of x squared is? 2x. All right, all right. So 3 times 2x, that will give you a 6x right here minus the derivative of 2x is 2, right? What's the derivative of 4? 0. All right. So if I take the derivative of that, I should get 6x minus 2, right? So here's my function. Take the poly derivative. 6x minus 2. Not bad, right? This is simple, right? Any questions? Other than embedding poly derivative commands inside of other poly derivative commands, is there a way to call upon specific uh, derivatives like the third derivative or the fourth derivative or the second derivative? Yes, and uh, we are going to have a lecture solely devoted to just symbolic math in general because it's more than just, uh, like this is pretty basic, let me put it like this. Later on we're going to be able to differentiate and integrate and all sorts of stuff. Uh, uh, simplify expressions, solve for x, and things like that. But it requires a little bit of discussion. But to, in a short version to answer your question, yes, you can. But we'll, we'll do that a little later. Sound good? All right. The only other thing that I really wanted to show you today is this. So if I give you all a, a big array, just a big table of numbers, Statistics, right? Mean, median, mode, standard deviation, uh, etc. <coughs> All of those um, uh, formulas are still, uh, or most of them, I guess I should say, are still applicable in MATLAB. The red ones, or the mean and the standard deviation, those are the only ones that are different from what we did in Excel. If you recall in Excel, if we wanted to calculate the mean of a big group of numbers, we'd say average. Where in Excel it's average, in MATLAB it's mean. Uh, for uh, uh, standard deviation, it was standard deviation or stdev.s, right? Here it's just S, uh, st, you know, standard deviation, std. So um, just you know, other than that, the formulas are are fairly identical. Sort is also a pretty good one. 
if you've got uh, values that are in some random order, it'll sort from smallest to largest. Sound good? Any questions? All right. That, uh, here's what I'm going to do. That's basically all I have for you for today. We're going to take these concepts and explore them in a little bit of additional detail throughout the rest of the semester. I want to make sure you all are comfortable with this fundamental stuff when we do things like for loops and we do some advanced stuff with plotting. Like I don't want to, here's my thing, I don't want to like show you all some plotting uh, uh, options and then in the midst of plotting options, you all forget how to create an array. So while I'm not assigning a homework on this today, I really want you all to be, to be comfortable with this. If you've got any questions, make sure you're, you're asking them. Sound good? All right, that's all I've got for you all today. Um, I will see you all uh, next time. Uh, all right, that's all I got.